Well, good afternoon, everybody. I think uh, we are right on the minute here. So I think we'll kick this off. So um, first of all, um, my name is Glenn Morrell. I'm the executive director at the Wyoming Energy Authority and very pleased to be able to moderate this panel today. Um, and a very for warm welcome to our three panelists, Dr. Steve Elmire from Idaho National Labs, Dr. Josh Jarrell from Idaho National Labs, and Professor Todd Allen from University of Michigan. Um, I will give them an opportunity to introduce themselves in much greater detail uh, during, when they um, start their, their presentations. Uh, and a very warm welcome to everybody who has dialed in today. Uh, this is a very interesting topic, not just for Wyoming, but for the nation and perhaps even uh, internationally as well. Uh, and this uh, webinar is um, the first of uh, quite a few we have planned to, to help our, our audience, both within the state and further abroad, understand what this really means, uh, not only for the Wyoming um, energy sector and the communities thereof, but also um, for the advancement of advanced nuclear technologies um, and, the, and the role of those technologies in a future energy sector as we move forward. Um, so first of all, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about um, who I am, uh, my role here at the Energy Authority, uh, and a few things, and, and to hopefully set the scene for a very basic level, a foundational level of why uh, advanced nuclear is such an interesting and important uh, role uh, aspect of a future e energy economy in Wyoming. So, um, like I said earlier, I'm, I'm Glenn Morrell. I'm the executive director here, and the Energy Authority uh, was established uh, the 1st July of 2020 to, um, in many in the simplest form to create a an agency that would could act in a coordinating role for all the energy activity that's going on within the state of Wyoming, both public and private. So the public side, the the energy uh, sector here is addressed by quite a few different um, agencies and authorities. There is no central Department of Energy for Wyoming, as there is a Department of Agriculture. It's spread across multiple agencies and, and uh, other um, organizations, which is in some ways a little strange given that the energy economy is such an important part of, of Wyoming's energy, uh, economy as a whole. Um, the energy sector is the largest component of the Wyoming um, economy in total. Um, it's also, Wyoming has the third largest energy economy in the country uh, on a state by state basis. And if Wyoming were a country, uh, we'd be the 13th largest energy economy and, and equivalent to that of Norway. And Norway of course is no slouch when it comes to energy. So the Energy Authority sits in the middle of it all, trying to make sure that there is a, a cohesive vision to what uh, the state agencies and, and hopefully our private partners are trying to do in terms of advancing the energy economy uh, in general. And we do that by developing and administrating the Wyoming Energy Strategy. And the Energy Strategy, as most strategies, uh, have uh, is a central unifying objective around continuing to power the nation within all of the above and uh, most importantly a net zero uh, carbon emissions um, objective. The net zero piece is very important because it's simply the only way that a traditional hydrocarbon based energy economy like that of Wyoming can continue to be relevant and sustainable and have access to our consumer markets in the future. Uh, another interesting statistic is that we export 90% of our energy uh, that's produced in Wyoming. 90% of it is consumed outside of our borders. And the market access, is, so the, obviously the market access is incredibly important. If we, can, we cannot uh, preserve that, then we're uh, going to have issues moving forward. So net zero becomes very, very important. Um, I could spend hours talking about the strategy, but I want to move on a little quickly. The the, the strategy itself has three primary initiatives, which are all really part of this vision to transform what we have today in a way that is um, adds a lot of value, takes a traditional economic setting and advances it um, through integration and, and of technologies and recognition of that is our aspiration. So we have a CCUS initiative, we have a hydrogen initiative, and the third one is advanced nuclear. And um, it has always been part of the strategy, but it was really brought to the fore by the big announcement in, in early summer when TerraPower in partnership with Pacificor and the DOE announced that they would build a test reactor, a natrium reactor. Um, it has since been announced it'll be in the Camera area. And aside from simply being a very, very exciting announcement, um, as a technology guy, I was super excited. I just thought that was the coolest thing ever. 
But what we've learned over the last um, four or five months or so, and it's been a very steep learning curve, is that it's much more than simply a test reactor. And we've learned that through consultation and engagement with our colleagues at Idaho National Labs, which has been uh, a tremendous benefit to the state. Uh, it's also been a tremendous benefit to me personally, but many of the people in the state have really benefited from simply having a conversation with our colleagues over there. Um, and one of the things we've learned is simply that it's, it's not just reactor, it's not just electrons, and it's not just Wyoming. So what do I mean by that? Well, I think we're probably gonna learn a lot about that from, uh, from the panelists, but to give you a quick idea, uh, it's not just a reactor, it's all about other value chains, manufacturing. You know, something about these new advanced reactors is that they're, they're, they're built, uh, the, the business case is built on being able to produce many of them rather than just one big reactor. You get economies by, by producing more and more and more of them. So there's a manufacturing opportunity there. Uh, Wyoming has a lot of heavy manufacturing capabilities uh, built on the back of the coal, oil, and gas sector for the last um, four or five decades or so. So there's a lot of capacity, and this is, represents an opportunity for them to build out of that uh, traditional sector. There's also a fuel cycle uh, opportunity there. Wyoming has a rich history uh, with respect to uranium mining, but that's only one very small part, well, significant, certainly, but it's a small part of the entire fuel cycle value chain that is uh, ripe for uh, taking advantage of. So you, you mine the uranium, but there's you know, you have to mill it, enrich it, actually produce a fuel uh, for these reactors. And that's certainly an opportunity for Wyoming as well. And perhaps the greatest opportunity really is how a, um, these advanced reactors and with respect to being able to provide high quality heat and power um, and most critically with zero emissions, how that integrates into a low emissions energy economy in the future and contributes to the development of um, the synthetic uh, products and with a lot of a ton more added value and other things like that. The final thing is simply that the, the advanced nuclear opportunity is, is it just aligns very, very well with the vision of the strategy. The vision is to transform a traditional economy into in a way that it became it remains relevant, it remains sustainable in a future decarbonized or low emissions world and adds a ton of value and, and richness to this um, this, this energy economy that we're very, very proud of. So with that, uh, there was a brief, very brief introduction, I admit, uh, but I wanna hand it over to the panelists who are experts in this area. And to start with, I'd uh, give a very warm welcome to Dr. Steve Omeyer from the Idaho National Lab. Uh, Steve, over to you. Uh, thanks, Glenn. So do you wanna jump right into the presentations or uh, uh, have, us introduce our, ourselves first. Well, I think you just introduce yourself and then go into your presentation and we'll work it that way through the, through the next okay. three. Sounds good. I appreciate that. So um, I'm, um, my name is Steve Allmeyer. I'm a senior advisor here at Idaho National Labs. I am not from uh, Wyoming, uh, but, uh, but pretty, pretty close to it. So I was born and raised a couple hours from Kemmerer in uh, Southeast Idaho. Um, grew up, uh, grew up in that part of the state, uh, went to school, uh, went to school here in Southeast Idaho. And that's where I, uh, got familiar with, had an opportunity to work for, uh, the national lab, Argonne National Lab, uh, at the time, uh, as a summer student. Um, so that was my introduction to all of this, um, advanced energy, uh, research, um, world. Uh, from there, went on to, uh, left the state, um, went to graduate school, got a PhD, and what I'm proud to say is the best nuclear engineering school in the country, and that's University of Michigan. Um, along the way, also went to University of Chicago and got an MBA. Um, found my way back to Idaho uh, about actually 27 years ago this week. Uh, I came back to Idaho, uh, where I've spent the past roughly three decades uh, then working in pretty much uh, evenly split between advanced nuclear energy, what I'm focused on right now, uh, national security uh, applications and, and, uh, and issues related to nuclear and radiological science, especially uh, counterterrorism uh, and also nonproliferation. And uh, the third area that I've spent quite a lot of time on is 
renewable energy and advanced manufacturing and the intersection with that with energy systems. So that's that's who I am um, uh, and, and where I've been the past uh, uh, 55 or, or so years. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to, to have this conversation and share with you just some of the perspectives. Uh, Christine, if you could advance a slide. Um, just share with you some of the perspectives I think might be of interest. Um, uh, hopefully it'll answer some of your questions, but, but mostly um, maybe give you an idea of where to ask questions for the future. Uh, and also uh, where you might want to spend some, some additional time digging in a little deeper. Uh, so I want to talk about um, really what's different with the markets that nuclear energy goes into uh, in the future. It, uh, it, it really is a, a different way forward than we've experienced in the past. Uh, and it's important to, to sort of have that picture of, of, um, of, uh, of what's different going forward versus say 50 years ago and even uh, 15 and 20 years ago. Um, that explains a lot about why you see different technologies um, coming forward today. Um, and also we can talk a little bit about really with those technologies, what's new and what isn't new. Uh, there's, there's a lot that's been done in the 65 plus years of commercial nuclear energy. So not everything that you see today is new, uh, but it might have new, um, new applications. Uh, I do wanna mention a little bit about the role of the national laboratories, uh, especially in advanced nuclear energy versus the industry versus uh, the government itself. Uh, that's, that's important to understand. And also then talk a little bit about uh, what, what Glenn began to, to scratch on. Maybe what, where is the economic potential of nuclear energy, uh, especially nuclear energy for Wyoming uh, in this evolving world of, of net zero? Um, net zero emissions. It really has changed things quite a bit. And then uh, tee up a few questions uh, you might, uh, one might, might consider. So, so with that, um, Christine, next slide. Uh, just very quickly, uh, you know, let's let's keep in mind where nuclear energy came. Commercial nuclear energy uh, really had its roots. Um, you know. 65 years ago when the first commercial nuclear energy plant was built, um, it was being built and, and nuclear energy was conceptualized really for, uh, for the market of, of that day. Very fast growing um, uh, electric uh, energy demand. It was a brand new technology. There really, there were not the, uh, the, the uh, operational uh, cultures and approaches put together yet. There wasn't, uh, there was just beginning to be uh, export uh, rules and regulations and, and, and the such. So brand new technology in a post-World War II uh, era. And keep in mind at that, at that time, uh, we um, globally, the, uh, the big we, were consuming about uh, four times less energy than we consume today. Uh, and even today, we're looking at uh, a growth in energy consumption uh, by about 50% just, uh, just in the next 20 years. So, so fast forward from this brand new technology, uh, the first commercial application, uh, very different world to today. Uh, there's about 440, 450 uh, reactors around the world uh, producing. Uh, about 10, 11% of electrical generation. Um, have a number there on what the, what the markets for nuclear technology and the associated operations, fuels and, and everything, 2.6 trillion uh, over the next two decades. I just saw a number um, actually just last week um, that put that number at about $8 trillion uh, over the next uh, two to three decades. So uh, the, the bottom line here is there's a mature, a very mature nuclear industry 
uh, out there globally. It's not going away. It's um, it's only growing, especially with um, with net zero goals uh, of various countries, not just for prim primary energy production, but products that the energy feeds. Uh, and as we look forward again to, uh, I always think about a world of of nine billion people. I mean, think about think about what that means in terms of the environment, in terms of energy demand, in terms of um, of of markets and stability around the world. Um, and and that's what frames uh, really frames my thinking about new, advanced nuclear energy is where we've been where we are today and, and where we're likely to be in the future. So next slide. Uh, and as nuclear energy over the past 65 years um, grew into this uh, global multi-trillion dollar uh, enterprise that's producing a good portion of, of, uh, of electricity uh, around the world, the lab, the national labs, and with respect to nuclear energy, uh, what is today the Idaho National Lab really played a, a, a very significant role. So uh, a boss of mine used to like to say uh, that the labs do what, what industry uh, academic, and academia can't, won't, or shouldn't. Um, and that's really the role of the lab. Lab isn't here to to sell anybody any technology. We're here to uh, we're here to innovate uh, to create uh, new both fundamental technologies, but also the enabling uh, science that goes goes with that. But also test and validate and feed that testing and validation back into the regulatory process back to. Uh, industry and and uh, and governments, so they can make informed decisions about where to go uh, with technology, and also work with the universities to spur innovation. So, uh, so the lab, uh, this laboratory, uh, has had a huge role uh, in 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 building up, helping establish that uh, that framework for what is today a global uh, global nuclear commercial nuclear uh, industry uh, next slide uh, so 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 today we we see quite a lot and we hear quite a lot about advanced nuclear technologies and and typically uh, the difference between what we saw in the past and what we see today in terms of commercial uh, interest, is focused on two things. One is on size, and the other uh, is on uh, simplicity. And, and in many cases, those two things uh, go hand in hand. Um, and simplicity translates can translate into even safer systems. You have extraordinarily safe systems now, but uh, simplicity uh, helps in both the economic um, position as well as uh, as well as operations of those machines, and we think in sizes, um, in kind of small, medium, and large. And I show some numbers up here. These aren't meant to be absolute cutoff points on what's small, what's medium, and what's large. In fact, um, you know, many people consider very small reactors, micro reactors, to be up to uh, fifty megawatts. Um, in in electrical uh, generation, then you have the medium-sized reactors. You know that might be 50 to 250, 300 megawatts, and then you have large reactors. Well, why is why is that uh, important? It's important uh, because just like you see in other industries that have matured, uh, the nuclear industry has matured and 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 is then moving beyond generation one and two and three technologies uh, to, to better match technology type to the actual application uh, that's, that's needed. And also advance um, the, uh, the constructability of the machines. I think about this in, in a similar way as I think about the aircraft industry, how they've, uh, aircraft have really segmented the markets based on size, based on range, uh, so you can optimize the uh, the technology to the application. Again, you see that across a number of industries 
uh, is a mature nuclear industry is no different. Uh, you also see uh, modular modularization uh, of those of those technologies, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a minute. And that can really help in terms of efficient deployment of capital resources, matching uh, a technology size and constructability to to an actual application, uh, not tying up capital for 10 years of construction. Um, and also we'll talk a little bit about matching generation to load, but, but all of these reactor classes um, have, uh, have very deep roots in the, in the national lab and in academic um, uh, areas, but in the, with the national labs, there's been a lot of testing validation on these classes. Uh, of of reactors, some more so than others, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in a few minutes. So that's kind of why you see these these different uh, types of machines uh, coming out now. Next slide. Uh, size does matter, and I wanted to uh, just dig on this a, a, a little more. So early on uh, in the nuclear uh, era, actually the first reactors were relatively small. The commercial nuclear reactors were relatively small in the order of 60 uh, megawatts. But for, uh, for the purposes of, of, um, of uh, economies or efficiencies, I should say, of of scale the machines got bigger and bigger and bigger and today uh, many of the reactors are thousand megawatt electric they go up to i think the european uh new european reactors are 16 uh, 1700 megawatts and that has a lot of implications for um uh for the the system and how it's designed with light water reactors when you have uh, systems at large, uh, they're high pressure systems. You have to put all kinds of of, um, of engineered um, uh, systems for uh, decay heat removal and and uh, and safety purposes. And these are most definitely not modular uh, uh, systems. These very large uh, reactors are generally uh, a unique uh, construction, a huge construction project in and of itself and just the, the nature of that construction project means you're putting a lot of capital at risk uh, for a long time. There's financing, financing becomes an enormous issue uh, and there's a risk premium to be paid. If anything goes wrong in construction, you're gonna get uh, delayed. There's also something else to keep in mind, you know, as economies have, have matured as well, uh, you can see in the United States, the uh, demand for electricity has actually gone down. The rate of growth uh, has gone down markedly over the past 60 years that nuclear energy has been here. So sometimes it really doesn't make sense to, to drop, uh, you know, 1500 megawatts new generation, or if you're talking about a multi-reactor uh, plant, you know, uh, multiples of that. Um, uh, into a market all at once. It makes much more sense to incrementally uh, provision the, uh, the amount of generation needed with smaller bite-sized pieces uh, that are easier to build. So, so in, this, in this regard, especially in these regards, uh, size uh, really, does, really does matter. And, and we're at a point now where we can size uh, the machines much better uh, to meet uh, the different types of markets, which are electrical generation, but we'll talk about uh, maybe more interesting non-electrical uh, uses of, of nuclear energy as well. Next slide. Uh, so let's just walk through uh, real quick these these types of reactors, and and I, I can make these slides available to you if you want to take a look at these uh, more in the in the future as well. So very large reactors, like I said, huge massive construction projects. They have very large uh, exclusion areas, so the uh, physical footprint uh, that those reactors uh, take up. Uh, are very large. It doesn't mean, you know, we shouldn't be considering where to where to build large reactors, especially around the world. Many uh, populations are energy uh, energy poor, uh, and they need 
big pieces of generation like that. But these are, are big, uh, uh, massive construction projects with, with big footprints. Um, I, I should have had a, note, uh, a notation on water uh, use in nuclear. I've, I've gotten that question several times. And water use in any thermal generation, whether it's coal, whether it's um, gas plants, whether it's nuclear, uh, it, it really doesn't matter what energy source uh, you're, you're generating uh, the heat with. Uh, the amount of water used is, is, uh, is a function really of the efficiency uh, of the system. So, so with nuclear in general, um, you can think about nuclear taking on the order of seven to 800 gallons per megawatt hour. Um, and, and you're going to see actually a little less water use with advanced gas plants because they're more efficient. You see about the same with uh, solar, uh, solar plants. So, so again, it doesn't matter what the size of the reactor is in the number of gallons per megawatt hour, it matters how efficient it is. So that's, that's just something to, to keep in mind with any uh, electrical uh, generator, thermal electric generator. Next slide. So, so uh, small reactors, and we'll talk about small and modular. Uh, those can be, those are two different considerations, but small modular reactors are something you hear quite a lot about uh, right now. They have much smaller uh, physical footprints uh, that they take up because of the, uh, the uh, bite-sized pieces, if you will that you put a plant together with uh, uh, much, much more uh, uh, in, in theory, more efficient to, uh, uh, to fabricate because the reactors are actually um, factory fabricated. Although you still have uh, all the capital construction that uh, is required to put together the physical infrastructure. Uh, but, but these reactors, uh, again, on the order of 60 to a couple hundred megawatts uh, electric, much smaller footprint. Uh, next slide. And then a, a really interesting class of reactors um, for a lot of different applications are what many people call uh, micro reactors or very small reactors. So, uh, so the notion is, you know, 50, really 50 megawatt electric or less. Um, where uh, you you can you can put these uh, these these systems are are meant to be factory fabricated, but also more of a cartridge core, typically. So when they when and they tend to be envisioned as having longer lifetimes, so up to ten year uh, lifetime. So when the core is expended, you take that and you store it where you would. Uh, used fuel, and then you replace that with another core. So some people call this uh, a nuclear battery. Some people have called it a quantum battery approach, where nuclear energy just becomes a plug and play uh, uh, sort of power of either an industrial process or a, uh, a remote uh, location, mining applications or others, or even larger industrial applications where you can imagine plugging these reactors uh, in piece by piece, for example, hydrogen generation or clean chemicals manufacturers. So, so these are really intriguing, very, uh, very small footprints uh, for the, these types of, of reactors. And there's just a heck of a lot of interest in those now actually, You'll probably see one of these will be the first demonstration projects um, uh, that you'll see here at the lab, probably within two to three years. Uh, next slide. Um, just a, a quick note on, on the number of, of different applications that you've seen across this spectrum of reactors. So those classes of reactors, are not new in and of themselves. I mean, we've built, we, the collective, we have built and operated, um, you know, the smallish commercial reactors, the shipping port reactor uh, was the first commercial uh, nuclear reactor. Then they've gone to kind of a medium sized, you know, the, uh, the example is a Cooper uh, boiling water reactor at 800 megawatts. Today, you see large thousand megawatt uh, Westinghouse AP 1000s. 
I mentioned the 1600 megawatt reactors. Um, well, what about small and medium reactors? Well, you've, we've, we've operated uh, those as well. Uh, many, for example, um, in the military uh, realm, you know, 20, 40, 80, 90 uh, megawatt reactors are, are powering ships all over the world and, and for other nations are powering uh, commercial and, and uh, uh, icebreakers and all kinds of different different vessels. Um, so, and, and then in terms of test reactors, we'll talk about that in just a minute. There's been quite a lot uh, built and operated as well. So, so there's been a lot. There is a lot of experience uh, building and operating very small, medium, and very large reactors, but. Uh, many of the advanced reactors are going back to a thinking of, of much smaller and much more modular. Next slide. Um, and the, mod the, uh, the, uh, the notion of modular reactors and especially integrated um, uh, systems within reactors is, is really very important. So on the left, and I don't expect people to be able to see uh, the uh, the words on this. Actually, maybe you can. Um, that that's a general layout of a of a uh, commercial pressurized water reactor, just just in general. But you can see uh, the equipment that's actually feeding into that that central that central uh, annular piece. That's the actual reactor core. Everything else is cooling systems and pressurizers that go on that. Well, today, uh, many of the reactor designs are going with much more of a, uh, uh, an integrated or integral uh, approach, uh, where much of that um, machinery is actually being placed within the reactor core. And there's, there's uh, inherent safety uh, benefits that go with that, but also manufacturability uh, of the system has been shown to be much more favorable. So again, uh, maturation of the technology, learning from the past uh, uh, 60, 70 years of experience. Next slide. Um, and and the, the, the demonstration and testing that's gone on with systems like that is really important. Um, because there's been, again, six, seven, actually seven and a half decades of testing evaluation of different types of reactors. Um, and those demonstrations were important in the past, they're important now, and they're gonna be very important in the future to, to continue to mature and improve the technology and be able to incorporate new, uh, new materials uh, and new, um, uh, new technologies within those systems, and one of the one of the more important ones, I think, um, that this group might be interested in, is uh, the uh, the program I actually grew up in uh, as a student, in a in an early researcher, and that's the uh, the experimental breeder reactor two. So EBR two. Uh, was a reactor that operated uh, here at uh, what's today the Idaho National Lab. Um, uh, the site was actually the Argonne National Lab West. Um, EBR2 is a sodium cooled fast reactor. Uh, so a cool type sodium cooled fast reactor. So, you know, you can think of the natrium class uh, of reactors, but this one was much smaller. It was about uh, 30 mega or 20 megawatts, 30 megawatts, uh, I think 20 megawatts um, electric. But that reactor operated very successfully uh, for over 30 years. Uh, demonstrated not just power production using um, uh, using this type uh, of reactor, uh, but also maintainability, uh, operations, set operations protocols, and maybe the most important thing. Uh, was a set of safety demonstration tests that they did uh, in 1986. And uh, this might be actually a, a, a topic that you'd be interested in a, in a whole hour of discussion and presentation. So during that safety demonstration test, they demonstrated uh, uh, with actual operations inherent safety. So you'll hear a lot about inherent safety 
features of advanced reactors. But uh, with that system, they demonstrated um, uh, two of the most aggressive types of accidents in a nuclear power plant can have, and that's loss of uh, flow, uh, coolant flow, without shutting the reactor down, and then loss of heat sink. So you're not able to shed the heat uh, and the reactor doesn't shut down. And, and in both cases, in, in a number of other tests, the reactor performed exactly, uh, almost exactly as they, they predicted. Temperature goes up a little bit and there's a, a negative, it's called a negative uh, temperature coefficient for the bulk of the reactor. And it shuts a reactor down without any operator um, uh, interference. So those were really successful uh, tests that I, unfortunately, many, many people don't talk enough about um, what's been demonstrated and tested uh, with those systems. So, so I wanted to point this out because there's a huge body of knowledge um, that, that one can lean on to understand these classes uh, of technologies. Next slide. Uh, in, the, in demonstrations, there's going to be an opportunity to, um, to take a look at demonstrations in the future uh, as well, because they're as important in the future uh, as they have been in the past. Uh, so both on our site uh, here in Idaho and, and in other sites, uh, you're going to see different reactors uh, demonstrated, different maturity of reactors. Um, you should see some very small reactors uh, demonstrated on this site uh, in the in the fairly near future, and then there's plans um, there's plans for other ones. And natrium, the natrium reactor, is uh, shown on that timeline as well. Uh, next next slide. So um, so I think you know for electricity production. Uh, which is which has been uh, the focus of advanced nuclear. Uh, actually, is there a slide before that, Christine? Yeah, there we go. So electricity production, of course, very important, especially in a net zero world where much more of our energy consumption is being pushed toward uh, the electric sector, for example, advanced transportation. But in today's paradigm, you know, a, a clean source like like nuclear is really only touching about it's about 15, 16 percent of the U.S. energy market. And that's because uh, nuclear in today's paradigm is only used for baseload electrical production. But more and more, that's not where uh, that's not where. Uh, it's not always where we, we need the energy. So we think about how one can better utilize uh, nuclear energy, especially through these very small and, and uh, smallish uh, sorts of plants to power very hard to, de very hard to decarbonize industry, steel production, uh, cement production, chemicals production, uh, uh, things of that nature, and also enable uh, the grid to, uh, to function in a safe and secure fashion as we put more energy demand regionally um, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the grid uh, with advanced transportation and such. Uh, so this is an exciting thing to think about. So you think about beyond uh, electricity, you think about how to match how do you create a, a reactor that's much more of a plug and play uh, used as a clean energy module uh, with, uh, with uh, industrial processes and such? So next slide. So if you can do that, um, you go from what's shown on the left, which is you know, nuclear big base load and then renewables, intermittent renewables, feeding the grid in, in more of an integrated energy paradigm, then you begin to think about how you, you how can you use nuclear as that high density energy source, very small modules at a time in an embedded uh, paradigm, embed the, uh, the nuclear generator uh, with an industrial process, with an advanced manufacturing process. Uh, and then like Glenn mentioned, if you can begin to think about that, that is how 
uh, some industries are moving. Uh, actually, advanced steel, green steel uh, manufacturing is is thinking about how to make smaller plants that are more regionally located, so you don't have the the risk and the the demand of tying into bulk uh, transmission grid. But if you can do that, then you think about the value associated with uh, engaging that, that nuclear market, not just from the standpoint of the reactor and the energy source, but also the, the, the modular industrial processes that is powering. So you begin to think about actually manufacturing integrated products. Uh, in integrated plants. And uh, as the world begins, as actually export policy uh, and, and tr global trade policy begins to change because of uh, net zero goals, being able to export that sort of thing, uh, modular industrial processes are powered by clean energy modules, becomes very, very intriguing um, and intriguing to quite a few people. Uh, so next slide. Uh, and I just wanted to give you just a quick picture. This is, I always found this an interesting chart. This shows uh, on, the, uh, uh, on, the, on the horizontal, uh, it shows the, the number of facilities that are in the country that exceed a greenhouse gas reporting uh, threshold. So large emissions uh, sources. And, and then on the vertical axis, it shows the average thermal load. So in Wyoming, you can see all the way uh, on the left, not all that many of these, uh, of these carbonate uh, businesses out there, but the ones that are there are, are energy, uh, very high energy consumption. Uh, fertilizer manufacturing, the same, of course, you know, with the petroleum refinery. Um, uh, a large heat load associated with those and also a large number of facilities. But that gives you an idea of the landscape of the number of industries that where one could um, begin to integrate nuclear uh, as, a, as a clean energy source to, to power those industries. And those are all, those are generally, these are generally more difficult to uh, get to a net zero. Uh, basis because they just require uh, just a lot of energy. Next slide. Um, so that's um, that's kind of what I what I wanted to 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 leave you with as a as a perspective on why nuclear going forward is a little different, or it's a it it is it is a, a natural uh, evolution of what we've seen in the past. There's a lot. Uh, that's been done in terms of uh, testing and validation of those classes of, of reactors, especially the sodium cool fast reactor. I want to draw your attention to that EBR2 uh, experience. I, I, I'm actually, these two pictures uh, that are on this slide um, are two of the reactor testing areas uh, at, the, uh, at the National Lab. The one on top is the, the old EBR2 site. You can still see the old dome. Uh, so that's a site I grew up um, uh, working at. And then the bottom one is the advanced test reactor that's uh, operating today and uh, uh, very successfully and safely. Um, so questions uh, I think is useful for, uh, for any stakeholder to uh, consider and think about. Uh, like I said, definitely rely on and engage your, your university uh, your community colleges, your energy authority, um, and, and the lab's happy to engage and, and, um, and answer questions as we can as well. Um, regulatory oversight, that's, that's something you know, you'll, you'll get involved with, although NRC is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is the, uh, the regulatory authority for nuclear materials and reactor operations. The state is going to have some um, uh, some footprint in air, water, land, cultural, uh, and and even uh, utility uh, uh, operation. Um, I would always I, I would always encourage people to encourage your uh, your leadership um, in any in any industrial enterprise to focus on operation operational excellence. 
um, many of the challenges that have been experienced globally uh, with nuclear industries and a number of under, other industries uh, are rooted in operations, not the fundamental technology. Um, jobs, we get a lot of questions about how many jobs are associated with a commercial uh, nuclear plant. Uh, one can think about um, the number of jobs directly tied to the plant. Uh, a lot of people talk about supply chain for nuclear. That's all the stuff that goes into the reactor and operations. I'd encourage you to think about the value chain of having a clean energy source. So instead of just putting electrons on the grid, what can you manufacture with it? And that's a, that's a force multiplier uh, for economic uh, value. And, and that's really the exciting piece. Um, and that ties to how do you then engage global markets with a clean energy um, uh, driven product, you know, whether it's chemicals or plastics or, uh, or cement or steel or whatnot. Um, uh, partnerships, I think are important. They're important to tap into that, that value chain, um, uh, both the value chain and the supply chain, quite frankly. Uh, Josh is gonna talk about fuel cycle. And, and those are really important things uh, to consider the reality of fuel cycle, both short and long-term planning. Um, and then I'll, I'll leave really where I, where I started. And that's, you know, lean on, lean on that 65, 70 years worth of knowledge, um, lessons learned and, and others to inform your questioning uh, and, and getting answers to your questions. And uh, so I'll leave it with, I'll leave it, leave it there and look forward to your questions after my colleagues are, are finished. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Uh, yeah, that, everybody, that is how it's going to work. We're going to go through the presentations first uh, and then go to Q&A. Uh, if you want to submit a question, there is a Q&A uh, function at the bottom of, the, of your screen. You should go ahead, right ahead and type those in. I will try and moderate my way through those, maybe even answer a few on the fly. Um, so uh, the next uh, present presentation is uh, by Dr. Josh Jarrell from Idaho National Labs. At Christine, I think this is the wrong presentation that's showing now. I think we're supposed to go to Josh next, but um, yeah, it looks like we've got that out of order. But uh, yeah, Josh, as we sort that one out, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Glenn. And, and uh, as, as Steve mentioned, let me kind of give a quick background uh, on, on me, who I am. So, so I'm a nuclear engineer. Um, I grew up out in Texas, actually. Uh, I went to school down at Texas A&M, which I would uh, argue is also a very good nuclear engineering program. Um, I got my PhD down there. Uh, I uh, came out of school and then uh, went and worked at Oak Ridge National Lab, which is on uh, the east side of Tennessee. And then about almost five years ago, I came out to Idaho National Lab, and I uh, currently manage a uh, used fuel uh, department here. Um, and so, so my group and, and, and my staff, they, they focus really on spent nuclear fuel. And uh, spent nuclear fuel is just one piece of the, the broader nuclear fuel cycle. Um, and that's what I'll be touching on today. Um, so let, let's just uh, go to the next slide, Christine. Is, I'm not seeing the next slide. Oh, there we go. Um, so, uh, you know, for any of these reactors, obviously you have to have nuclear fuel to, to operate these reactors. And so when we talk about some of the, the, the fuel cycle, the supply chain, I think it's important to, to, for everybody to kind of understand what, what that entails. And so um, uranium uh, is, is the key for nuclear reactors, at least for the, the, the vast majority of the currently operated ones. Um, and so, so we, we pull uranium out of the ground, we mine it. Um, when uh, uranium comes out, it's natural uranium. And there's a specific isotope, uranium-235, that you really uh, need uh, for reactors to operate effectively. And so... Uh, the amount of uranium-235 in uranium is at a little bit less than 1% uh, in natural uranium. And what you need, at least in the current uh, operating reactors, the large, uh, you know, 1,000 megawatt sort of reactors, light water reactors that Steve mentioned, is you need fuel that's about 5% enriched with this uranium-235. 
And so once you mine it, you have to then enrich it up to about 5%. You can then fabricate the fuel and I'll, I'll get into these details. Then, then once you have fuel that, that's, that's in the right form, you can put it into a nuclear plant and operate that plant. Um, after um, maybe several years, uh, the fuel is no longer useful uh, in that current plant. Uh, and then it, the, the fuel comes out and it's spent fuel. And so you have to manage the spent fuel. And the, the, the goal for spent fuel, um, it, at least in the US, is to eventually dispose of it in a deep uh, geologic repository. Um, there's also the option of, of recycling or reprocessing the fuel. Um, however, the U.S. doesn't generally uh, use this process. Instead, it goes, um, Christine, we hit the next slide. We do the one, what we call the once through cycle. So, so we do not reprocess or recover the uranium. We, we uh, just basically at this point, because we do not have an operating disposal um, repository, uh, we basically are storing the, uh, the material right now at the current uh, reactor sites. And so um, this is kind of uh, in the broad scheme of things, what the fuel cycle looks like. Um, really, you know, we generally operate these light water reactors, this current fleet that we have. Um, the advanced reactors uh, that, that we're talking about uh, may have other opportunities to potentially recycle in the future, but right now this is where we're at. So if you go to the next slide, we'll start with just the mining and milling. Um, Wyoming has a uh, extensive history of actually of, of uranium, uh, uranium mining. Um, there are uh, three different types of mining um, and, and some in, in uh, two of those types of mining, milling is required to concentrate the uranium. Um, and uh, when you pull it out of the ground and you're, you basically have what we call a uranium oxide. So, so that's important to note because the, the form of the uranium does matter um, for several of the steps in the fuel cycle. One thing, if you look on that far right image that shows um, the uh, uranium production in the US by year, uh, and the far left I think is 1996, you'll see that the production over the last four or five years is down dramatically. Um, to, to essentially ze almost zero. Um, and so there, there's reasons for that. Um, but it's something to just keep in mind that Wyoming, which is one of the largest uh, uranium uh, producing state, was the, the, the largest uh, uranium mining producing states, um, has basically wrapped up or greatly reduced the uh, amount of uranium that it's mining uh, at this point. Um, all right, so next slide. Uh, maybe I'm seeing multiple slides. There we go. Okay. Um, so, so enrichment. Um, one of the things, uh, as I mentioned before, is uranium. Uh, natural uranium has less than 1% of uranium-235. So you need to enrich that uranium-235 up to about 5%. Um, and there's a couple different ways to sort of proven um, methods uh, to enrich uranium. Uh, one is uh, centrifuges, which are small, um, basically cylinders that spin um, the uh, uranium and can separate, uh, basically uh, use the physics that, that some of the isotopes are heavier than the others and, and enrich that fashion. Um, that image right there is a bank of centrifuges. Um, there's also a diffusion method um, uh, that you, know, you can basically use diffusion and, and again, uh, the size uh, of the isotopes to, to enrich. Um, but for both uh, enrichment methodologies, you have to convert that uranium oxide that I talked about that's basically like when you come out of the ground to, to a gas, to a fluoride, they call it UF6 or um, uranium hexafluoride. And um, so when you hear the term conversion or deconversion, you're basically changing the form of the uranium from an oxide to a, a, a gas or um, a, a fluoride. So if you go to the next slide. All right, so 
Um, this is just kind of given the state of play of the enrichment facilities. Uh, diffusion uh, was, was very popular um, 30, 40, 50 years ago, uh, really to support um, the nuclear industry, but also nuclear weapons. Um, and there were was, there was several diffusion plants, Kentucky, Ohio, and Tennessee. Uh, none of them are actively uh, producing uh, uh, enriched uranium through diffusion anymore. These tend to be very large facilities, very in energy intensive facilities. Um, and so that's kind of the one of the reasons that the diffusion plants have kind of uh, have gone away to, to the centrifuge uh, concept. So there is an active uh, enrichment capability in New Mexico. Urenco is the name uh, of the uh, uh, facility. They've been operating for a little over 10 years. Um, and one thing that's interesting, and I, I haven't mentioned it yet, so I'll, I'll do that now, is um, the normal light water reactors that we have uh, need about 5% enriched. However, a lot of the advanced reactors are looking at up to maybe 20%, 19 to 20% enriched uh, uranium. And so one of the questions is where and what facilities are available to do that next sort of phase of enrichment. So. Um, Urenco has actually stated they'd be interested in producing this higher enriched uh, uranium. They actually call it HALU, which is high assay, low enriched uranium. So that's that 19 to 20% uh, material, though they have not moved forward. However, um, there, there has been a facility that's kind of came up and in, in, uh, is now running in Piketon, Ohio, which was the facility that was originally a diffusion plant. They've now used uh, or now set up some centrifuges to actually uh, develop and produce um, high assay, low enriched uranium. And that has actually been a cost share. So the Department of Energy has, has provided funds over the last three years um, to basically set up that enrichment facility. Uh, they did receive their, their operations license from the NRC, which is the, the regulator of the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, um, and they hope to start uh, production in 2022. All right, so how about next slide? Okay, perfect. So, so once the uranium is enriched, uh, you can actually fabricate the material. And um, as I noted before, the enrichment again is in this gaseous phase, you actually move it back to an oxide because in light water reactors, uh, we use a uranium oxide uh, based fuel. And so then you actually get, create these small pellets, which is that top right uh, figure is actually a uranium oxide pellet. Um, You'll form it, and then you'll actually, what they call encapsulate it. You'll put it inside of some other cladding material. Uh, generally for light water reactors, we use a zirconium clad, but uh, for some of these advanced reactors, you'll have different fuel forms and you'll have different cladding materials. Now there are several active fabrication plants. Um, again, we, we do have almost 100 uh, light water reactors operating. And so they, they need continual fuel um, each year. And so there are three big plants, uh, one in North Carolina, one in South Carolina, and uh, one in the state of Washington that, are, that generate commercial fuel. So that image on the bottom right is actually a light water reactor fuel bundle. And then there's also two non-commercial fabrication plants, in one in Tennessee and one in Virginia, that can go to much, that can handle uh, fabrication of fuel to much higher enrichments. Um, for example, the, the naval reactors, uh, they would generate the fuel for the for, for the, the subs and carriers. All right, if we go to the next slide. All right, so that's how what we call the front end of the nuclear fuel cycle generally works. Um, and then again, you, you put the, re the fuel into a reactor and then afterwards it's spent fuel. And so this is actually the bulk of the work that I do on a day-to-day -day basis is looking at what we do with the spent fuel. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, light water reactors use this uranium oxide with zirconium cladding. Uh, the picture on the top right is an example assembly. And so after a, about five years in the reactor, and it kind of depends a little bit on the operations and the design of the reactor, the fuel is no longer usable in that reactor um, and it's declared spent. When the fuel comes out, uh, it's very radioactive. Um, before it goes in, if it's just uranium, um, it's actually, uranium itself is not uh, super radioactive. It's not that dangerous. In fact, you saw pe people actually, you know, sort of handling pellets and, and, and the assemblies before they go into the reactor with gloves. 
So it's a relatively uh, benign uh, material. However, afterwards, um, you do have a lot of radioactive material um, in the spent fuel. And as such, it's not something that, you know, somebody could go up and, and touch. And so it needs to be shielded and cooled because it still has residual heat coming off of it um, for, for a few years. And so all of that spent fuel in the light water reactors actually goes into the pools. And um, these are uh, very deep uh, pools. Uh, picture on that bottom right just shows an example pool. Uh, where the, the fuel generally will sit for at least three to five years. Um, all reactors have spent fuel pools at them. Um, and they were designed, the pools themselves were designed to, to support those reactors. Um, however, uh, these reactors are operating for 40, 60, um, maybe 80 years. And so those, po those pools are actually starting to fill uh, up. And because of that, um, the utilities are moving to dry storage. And so the picture in the middle is actually a very large dry storage system. So those are co big concrete cylinders. And inside the cylinders, there's generally a, uh, a welded steel canister. And inside that canister, there's spent fuel. And so um, now uh, at, the, at the reactor sites, uh, they'll load a few of these st dry storage systems uh, about every other year to make sure that they have plenty of room in their pool to discharge uh, the spent fuel similes that are coming out. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see uh, some more details about those dry storage systems. Um, we have dry storage system at Idaho National Lab actually, um, but across the US there's, uh, well, let's see here. I think there's over 3000 systems now. Um, my numbers are uh, a couple of years dated here. Um, and these systems, again, are very large. Uh, diameter of some of these, these cylinders can be six, eight feet and, you know, 20 feet plus tall, huge hundred you know, ton sort of uh, concrete and reinforced steel sort of structures um, that protect the spent fuel, uh, shield it from the, from the environment um, and, and provide shielding to those outside. So you can see in the bottom right, maybe, um, how big those systems are and some and there's actually a, a person there for context so very large very robust structures uh, generally for the most part again they're uh, you they're concrete and, and steel but but they actually have a internal canister in them it's a stainless steel welded uh, canister where the spent fuel goes in and the idea for that canister is that you can then transport that material uh, in the future away from the, the current sites and so if you go to the next slide uh, you'll see some examples of the of the uh, transportation approach, and so basically you'll pull that canister out of storage and place it into a, a different transportation configuration. The the bottom right is actually images of transportation um, cask uh, on a rail car, actually, um, and these uh, these casks are incredibly robust. Again, huge uh, hundred plus ton uh, structures, and the regulator, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, really. Uh, certifies and, and, and make sure that they will withstand several different accident scenarios. And so um, they, they actually are, are, uh, have to be tested to, to survive uh, several different accidents, fires, submersions, drops. Um, and, and the last thing here I'll note on the transportation piece is we have been transporting spent fuel uh, around this country as well as worldwide for several decades um, without sort of any uh, significant incidents. Uh, there's some, we, we know of at least 25,000 shipments and there's probably close to double that that have probably happened um, in some of the other countries that, that we don't have maybe as good of records with, but have been made over the last uh, you know, 50 to 60 years uh, without uh, incidents of release of radioactivity damage to the, the public, that sort of thing. So very safe, very robust uh, system for transporting this material. So the goal though, of course, is to be able to transport it somewhere off of the sites. Again, I mentioned that uh, disposal, which is generally deep underground repositories are the plan. But in the US, we, we don't have an active uh, repository program being worked. Uh, we do have a site, but but uh, it, that program is, is, is not being uh, pursued right now by the, the federal government. And as such, we're looking for interim uh, solutions to manage this, this material. So if you go to the next slide.
There we go. So we're looking at um, opportunities to site interim facilities that their whole intent is to store this material for the next few decades. Um, currently, as I mentioned, we have these, you know, 100 or so, or a little less than 100 now, unfortunately, uh, operating nuclear reactors, and each of them is storing their fuel on their site. And the idea is to consolidate that at some location in the future. Um, again, the canisters are designed to be transportable, and so the idea is we would transport them somewhere else. There have been a couple um, private initiatives, one in New Mexico and one in Texas. Actually, they're both right across the, the New Mexico-Texas border from each other. And uh, those are moving forward uh, with a regulatory body. Actually, uh, the, the one in Texas, the Waste Control Specialist um, uh, Storage Facility actually just received uh, NRC approval. Um, the, the one in New Mexico is still uh, under, under review by the NRC. Um, but those approvals are really on the on the technical grounds, which is is it safe? Is it is it going to protect the public? Um, there have been there has been political opposition in both of those states, so I think that's important to note. Um, and regardless, the goal again is to move to some uh, to to a repository in the future. Uh, one other thing uh, that is of interest is DOE outside of these private initiatives has been looking at um, citing a consolidated storage facility. And specifically, they just released this last week, a request for information from interested uh, communities parties on what siting, uh, what the process for siting such a facility would look like. So I, uh, I did include the link there. If there's uh, it, communities in, in, in Wyoming or other places that might be interested, I do encourage you to go to and respond to that request for information. Uh, comments are due uh, right now, I think uh, in early March. So. Um, next slide. All right, there we go. Um, so the, the final step for the, the fuel cycle is, is repositories, and that's the uh, deep underground repositories. Um, these can uh, be done technically, um, though not for spent fuel. Uh, there is a uh, deep underground repository for uh, long-lived uh, radioactive waste, transuranic waste in New Mexico, uh, the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, WIP. Um, so so that, that facility has been operating um, for the last couple of decades. Um, ha there, there have been some, some, some issues there, but it's now up and operating again. But it is not licensed for spent fuel. Uh, the Yucca Mountain site in Nevada was the, um, and, and really technically on the books is still the US repository site. Um, However, uh, the federal government has basically said this is not a workable option anymore, uh, not for technical reasons, but for, for more political reasons. The NRC actually did sort of uh, evaluate uh, the Yucca Mountain license application and, and did not come back with any sort of technical showstoppers. Uh, there, there's still some other things that have to happen, but, but for now that program is sort of on pause in the country. Um, there have been three other, or, well, several other countries that are moving forward. Uh, mainly in Europe that are a little farther along in this deep repository. So then I, one more slide. All right, so the advanced reactor. So, and this is maybe let me just tie this back into Steve's talk. Um, but, you know, the advanced reactors are different sizes, they're different shapes, um, and they have different fuels. And, um, you know, that get, there, there are opportunities and challenges associated with that. Um, again, I, I think the Want some of the discussion on EBR2 and the safety case lends itself to this sort of walk away safe, I think is the term people have been using. But generally, as I mentioned earlier, the fuel needs um, higher enrichments. Uh, and, and so because of that, you may choose different materials um, and different fuel forms. And so there are, are several different fuel forms. There's metal fuels, there's graphite fuels, uh, molten salts are being considered. Um, all of these have different sort of challenges with, a, with the fuel cycle, again, because you know, the fuel cycle that we have now, like fuel fabrication, for example, is focused on uranium oxide light water reactor fuels for the most part. And so um, you know, looking at these other fuels, we need to make sure that we have that capability to fabricate you know, different fuels. And uh, so that, that's something that's a little different. The other piece is, you know, that very first slide I talked about in the US, we're in this once through cycle, they call it the open fuel cycle. So we don't reprocess. 
some of the the disease advanced reactors have the potential to um, really jumpstart some of the reprocessing recycling um, conversations to close that fuel cycle. Um, a lot of the the fuels, uh, you know, at twenty percent enriched, you know, after discharge, they might you know be be very useful for other uses, and so. Um, we are seeing, by the way, that we, um, this recycle specifically looking at getting access to fuel for advanced reactors. Um, the EBR2 reactor that, that was mentioned earlier, actually, we are recovering that uranium and down what we call down blending it to about 19 to 20% enriched for future uh, advanced reactor needs. So that's just an example of something that we are actively working on. Um, I did want to just maybe go to the next slide. Let's see here, I'm still, oh, there we go. And just maybe I'll just leave you with some of the different images. So, so the far right one is, is a light water reactor. So these are very uh, uh, square, thin, tall, uh, uranium oxide, zerk clad fuels. But we have extensive experience actually with several reactors that have other fuel forms. Uh, and there are lots of different sizes and shapes. Um, there's, you know, the bottom left is actually a pebble bed reactor. So those are actually um, spheres of graphite that have um, uranium, what they call triso particles inside them. Um, but, but we at the, at INL and specifically the National Lab Complex have been looking at uh, different reactors, all, all these reactors that, that have been proposed as advanced reactors have some basis in research at the labs, whether it's a fuel development, whether that's performance, um, you know, material and corrosion uh, capabilities, those sort of things. So these, these have been looked at for, for several decades uh, at, across the complex uh, in national labs and through, you know, DOE and, and others. So, I think that's it. Um, if we go to the last slide, I think it's just images um, of spent fuel cask um, at different places. The one on the right is actually at INL, but I want to answer questions now. I want to leave time for the next speaker um, and then I'll be happy to answer questions um, at the end. So thanks very much. Thanks, Josh. Uh, there was a question come through about posting that link to that uh, consent based uh, citing uh, RFI. Uh, everybody, if you're still interested in that, go to the Q and A. Open up that Q and A uh, box and go to answered. Uh, it was a question, a request by Emily Nichols, and I have posted that link, or at least that link should get you started. I hope. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, our last speaker uh, today is Professor Allen from University of Michigan. Uh, over to you, uh, Professor. All right. Thanks a lot, Glenn, and thanks, Steve and Josh, for the. Um... The presentations. A little bit of history. I'm currently the uh, chair of the Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences Department at the University of Michigan. Uh, sort of going backwards through my career, I've taught here at Michigan. I've taught at Wisconsin. Uh, I've worked out at the Idaho National Lab site where Steve's at first as a early career researcher and then later as the deputy lab director for science and technology. So I have experience with the national labs. I've worked at a think tank in Washington, D.C. And I started out my professional career as an officer in the U.S. submarine force. So that's where I actually learned how to run a nuclear reactor. Uh, so uh, my remarks really to talk about uh, where we are in the 21st century with uh, nuclear energy. So next slide, please. Uh, and go ahead, um, click one more. All right, thanks. So I'm going to start out my, my uh, talk. Uh, by saying that energy is important, right? Energy makes our lives better. Um, the two pictures at the, uh, the top demonstrate differences in life uh, that's available or possible uh, due to energy access. And it's, it's more than just you know, how we clean our clothes. It's, it's how we get water, uh, irrigation, heat and cool our houses, vaccinations, everything, right? Um, and if you click one more time, um, what we keep demanding uh, as time goes forward is that energy gets cleaner, that it gets more affordable, that it gets more resilient, right? It's, it's always on or when it does go off, it returns quickly. Um, and more and more that the benefits and uh, risks of energy use uh, are distributed uh, more equitably, right? So I think that's where we are. Where we are. Next slide. 
And um, playing off a, a slide that, that Steve also used, uh, this energy system is in a, an amazing transition. So I look back at to when I was a kid and the electricity system was very simple, right? We would make electricity at large central station power plants and we would send it via transmission and distribution lines to people's homes, right? It's very simple. Um, now uh, it's much more complicated, right? We've added variable sources like wind and solar. Uh, why? Well, because uh, the fuel is free. All right, we don't have to pay for sunlight, we don't have to pay for wind, and we brought the costs down for uh, those energy sources. So they're being added to the grid. Uh, computer information technology allows us to ramp up and down on a real-time basis the amount of power we use in our homes or in our businesses, industrial facilities. And so in the context of nuclear energy, we've gone from a system that really encouraged us to build very, very large electricity generating machines and we're moving into a world where there's an opportunity for a lot of different products, right? And I think you saw that framed out in Steve's talk. So that's sort of big picture item one is the opportunities for all energy technology, including nuclear, are changing, right? Okay, next slide. And I think, you know, the, the things that people care about that drive energy choices, uh, including nuclear energy, um, are driven by things like emissions. Right. I mentioned we constantly want our um, energy to be cleaner. Right? A lot of discussions now where cleaner means less carbon, but you know, over time it's also meant uh, less particulate and a lot of other things. Right? No one really appreciates uh, when their neighbor's burning a lot of stuff in their backyard if the wind's heading towards you. Right? So we're driving towards cleaner systems, whether you're the user or whether you're the producer. Okay, next slide. We want systems that are more resilient. Uh, use the, the cold energy event in Texas this last winter where lots of things went wrong because the system wasn't resilient, right? Gas, gas lines were freezing. Um, some of the renewable sources were taken offline. One of the four nuclear plants in the state uh, had to be taken down, right? So as we're looking at new opportunities for energy systems, it's also, how do I create energy products, right? That um, not only deliver that clean electricity, but make sure right, that it comes to people's homes or their businesses in a very consistent manner. And I think that drives us to using systems of energy technology rather than sort of single types. Okay? And um, you know, I personally believe that's why nuclear has a strong future in a clean energy uh, world because each different type of energy production system does something well and is not not as good in other things all right it's the system that matters okay next slide please um the jobs and the supply chains matter right this is just one estimate from the world nuclear association that says you know we're talking about trillions of dollars over a decade in new jobs associated with uh, growing the nuclear supply chain right where is it growing right now it's growing very fast in countries like china uh, United Arab Emirates has recently built a lot of plants. Uh, India has plans. And so um, in addition to supplying clean energy for domestic uses, there are jobs and supply chain initiatives associated with that, whether that's domestic or international. Right? So there's a lot of um, value right, placed on the jobs that are associated with, with um, being the, the communities that host energy technology. All right, next slide, please. And then in a lot of cases, there are national or international security uh, questions around the holders of energy. Um, this is true in the nuclear world, right, where we talk about uh, the ability to control uh, or influence international norms on safety and security and safeguards, and how um, it's very difficult to do that if you are not um, part of the international or national nuclear commerce. Right? I think national and international security issues are bigger than just nuclear. I mean, you see this in questions like national natural gas pipelines that come from Russia into Europe uh, and whether or not that's a, a stable um, platform for energy needs in Europe, right? So all, lots of different values associated with how we uh, create and use energy technology and the 
the choices made around those values are also opportunities, right? In order to provide clean energy, resilient energy, um, the jobs associated with that and the national and international security uh, implications of, of the types of energies that we use. All right, next slide. So where are we in commercial nuclear, right? So uh, we started building nuclear power plants in earnest in about the, the early 1970s, late 1960s. And we built them at a pretty rapid clip for about three decades. So we were building about 30 big nuclear plants. And as a thumb rule, you know, a big nuclear plant is you know, millions of homes in one plant. So you had a tremendous amount of electricity out of one uh, traditional nuclear plant. This went on for about three decades and we leveled out at about 20% of the US electricity. Uh, that's over half the zero carbon electricity in the US right now. So nuclear is a very significant portion of the zero carbon electricity in the US. Over the last 10 or so years, um, we've changed the, the markets. We've changed the way we reimburse in a lot of cases, uh, energy producers. And in some cases, we've started to shut down some of the earlier nuclear plants. Um, still around 20%, um, partly because we're getting much, much better at operating the, the first generation plants, and therefore they're down less for maintenance, and therefore we're getting more electricity out of a single plant. But we are at a point where we started to lose some of the plants and there's this question, right? Are we at an off ramp where we'll slowly shut down the rest of the plants and um, slowly is on the order of decades, right? Some of these plants could, could run another 10, 20, 30, 40 uh, years. Or are we at an inflection point where a new generation of nuclear products that fit into that more complex energy uh, picture that both Steve and I used um, come into the market, right? So, that's where we sit right now. We go to the next slide. And it's a really interesting discussion to me because um, I like this slide because I've grabbed six examples of products that now we take for granted, right? That they, uh, the benefit we get from those are more than any, um, any possible risk associated with them. And sometimes uh, if you haven't read the history, it's surprising that these were ever controversial. So starting in the upper left-hand corner, I've got coffee, I've got mechanized farming, I've got electricity, um, mechanized refrigeration, margarine, and a printing press. Right? And in their day, there were big discussions about whether um, incorporating these technologies were an advantage uh, or whether the risks were too much. Right, and I'll, I'll use the lower right-hand picture, mechanized refrigeration as the, my favorite example in this story because there was a time in the US and worldwide where we were arguing whether refrigerators or ice was a better way to cool our food. And there was a big commerce associated with, with transporting ice right, around the country. And there were big arguments about whether um, uh, mechanized refrigeration was unnatural in some way and changed the properties of your food and that, that ice was more natural. Um, but over time, right, we've sort of evaluated the risk and benefits of these, these various technologies and they've been, been common. And I just, I think it's interesting history because we're at the end of the first discussion around nuclear power, right? We're looking to see what improvements to the technology will be available in the second generation both in what they do, right? But also in some of the characteristics like Steve and Josh talked about. So I think it's a fascinating uh, time in, in, in nuclear and I'm um, pleased to be part of that discussion. So next slide. And as Steve mentioned, we're going from a, a sort of a design paradigm where we had one type of reactor, right? We, the this, this system in the seventies, um, uh, stay on that past one for a second, um, really incentivized us to build these very large complex systems. And, and Steve talked to you already about some of the consequences of going to that size um, relative to safety systems and other things. And now as we look forward, we've got a new paradigm that's saying maybe big is not the only way to design a product. Um, clearly some of these big reactors are still of value in places like China where they're building them. But internationally, um, a gigawatt scale reactor may not always make sense. And so we're looking at things that are smaller and modular and maybe off grid. Okay, next one. 
And, and a lot of times you'll get, you'll hear uh, people talking about next generation nuclear in terms of technologies, right? It's a sodium cooled reactor, it's a gas cooled reactor. And that's interesting from the technologist uh, perspective, but I think from an average person perspective, what's more interesting is the business functions, the things that people are, are um, aiming to develop these products for. So yes, still electricity, maybe in some cases electricity on the grid, but some cases it may be off-grid uses or dedicated electricity to a specific industrial user. It could be heat, high temperature heat for industrial processes, low temperature heat for uh, heating homes and businesses or agricultural use, um, or sometimes it's both, right? A single system that can transition back and forth depending on where the energy is most effective and useful at a specific time. The size is different. First generation, all very large. Designers now looking at everything from a gigawatt to things that are about one thousandth the size of a first generation commercial plant. And this includes opportunities, and these are just a few examples, it's not meant to be exclusive, but replacing a coal plant uh, with another electricity generating nuclear plant. Uh, dedicated industrial heat or power to a consumer. You may have read things in the paper about uh, nuclear companies signing agreements with Bitcoin mining companies, right? Bitcoin, whether you like it or not, um, if you think it makes sense or not, uh, it uses a lot of energy, right? And if so, and you want to do that in a clean way, nuclear may be the answer for that dedicated power. Um, Off-grid remote locations that may currently use something like uh, diesel, uh, which could be expensive and needs to be transported, maybe a very small reactor fits in a place like that. Uh, similarly, maybe a very small reactor makes sense um, in something that's more urban or suburban like EV charging, right? If we're going to go towards large numbers of electric, electric cars, they've got to be charged by something, right? Maybe uh, a micro reactor would make sense in that case. So it's different business functions. All right, next slide. And at this inflection point, I at least notice um, the conversation pivoting some, right? In the sense that and in a lot of cases, the discussions are around climate change, uh, but it's not, not always. Um, but organizations that you traditionally might not have thought of as um, standing up and saying publicly that there's a value to nuclear energy um, becoming visible. And I just, I'd list a few here, right? So the Nature Conservancy, uh, big environmental organization, their, their long-term plan says you need uh, nuclear as part of the future. Um, Google says to, to power their, 20, their server farms 24 seven carbon free, you need nuclear. Um, even organizations like the Univer Union of Concerned Scientists, which have never been big fans of nuclear, have at least come out and said, please don't shut down the, the uh, current generation of nuclear plants uh, early, right? Because they are important zero carbon sources. All right, so I think in the technology sense, it looks like we're, uh, it may be at an inflection point. There's certainly a lot of companies looking at different opportunities in the public discussions, right? In some ways, it feels like we're having a different discussion than we might've been having 20 years ago. Uh, next slide. All right, so it gets back to sort of choices and design, uh, choices and values, right? The designers are envisioning a large number of new applications for nuclear technology, right? So, but what's that mean for a community? So if we go one more, right? I would argue that communities are in a position to envision a large number of deployment scenarios for their technology, right? In the past, communities were typically a host uh, for a technology that someone else designed and brought to the community and said, hey, would you like to be the host of this, right? I think now communities are in a position to say, we would like to be the host, but we'd like to get a lot more out of it, right? That aligns with our values, right? Then might have been the case in the first generation 1970s deployment. So click one more. I mean, I, my suggestion is communities should lead rather than react, right? Don't wait for somebody to come to you and say, hey, I've got an idea for a power plant. Are you interested? Um, and second, build on it rather than just maintain what you have. Um, Steve talked about this a little bit. I'll talk about it some more. I think there's more value in just the electricity or the energy that you're putting out of the plant. Okay, next slide. For a little context, those first generation nuclear plants um, a thousand megawatts, one gigawatt, right? It's very simple plan. I mean, the whole point is you use a nuclear process to generate steam, you use steam to turn a turbine, the turbine's connected to a generator, you make electricity, right? Um, those large plants are good job 
uh, creators in uh, communities. So roughly 600 jobs, typically people talk about a three times multiplier, right? Three jobs in the community for every job uh, that's at the plant, right? So that's why for a lot of communities that have been hosts of nuclear power plants, you know, one of the, the values direct to the community, right? Are the, the jobs and the associated val uh, value that comes with that. If you click one more, this is just a, a cartoon. It's not meant to be uh, exactly the nature and design. Um, but one, one thing to note about a lot of the advanced reactor concepts is um, in some ways, right, they, they mimic the past generation plants and that we're trying to make steam or at least generate some sort of heat from the nuclear reactor. How we do that may be different in every specific design. But like, I, if you look on the Natrium site, they will say they're a, about a 350 megawatt plant, right? Not quite as big as a large reactor, but big, right? And a significant number of jobs for a community, right? So the, the things that you can do with advanced nuclear at a minimum, right, for these size plants look similar to what a community can have from a traditional light water reactor. Um, so if you go to the next slide. But I think it's important to recognize that in the first generation of plants, Right. In many cases, we built the plant in a fairly remote place, and it was great jobs until they went away. Um, and in some cases, these first generation nuclear plants that are shutting down, um, the, the announcement of the shutdown came uh, very suddenly or unexpectedly to the communities. And there wasn't a lot else built up around. Right. So this is a major loss of tax revenue, a major loss to sort of the center um, of, a, of a community. And so I think in looking forward, it's really, really important right, to think about what else you can do if you're the host of a major energy technology production um, uh, plant like a nuclear energy uh, plant. So if you could go to the next slide. So I think what's important is to think about other options that align with the local values, right? What can you do and what do you want to be? And these are just some, it's not meant to be exhaustive, uh, but can you co-locate co other businesses that optimally use the energy, right? Don't just be an exporter, right? Figure out how to do things, make water, make hydrogen, use low temperature heat for various local things. Um, maybe become a training center, right? If you're the first uh, deployers of a new technology, you suddenly know more about that than anyone relative to how to build, how to operate. Um, how to get value from a plant. And so people will value that knowledge. Why not take advantage um, and, and become a training center? Um, as I mentioned, and, and Steve mentioned, there's supply chain opportunities, right? In building these plants, especially as number version number two and three, and they become deployed internationally, right? There's business opportunities associated with uh, these plants that are bigger than just the electricity or the energy that you can can sell. And there may be spinoff technologies. Um, I'm inspired by the history of nuclear energy in Korea, where they talk about uh, after the Korean War being a fairly poor society who made what was a very large investment for them to get into nuclear. But the, the, the knowledge learned from operating high technology systems, they then developed into things like big manufacturing. And now if you, you look at Korea, they're very good at, at big manufacturing and other technology that they will point back to their history. It started because they made a decision right, to, to build and host nuclear power plants and all the spinoff opportunities that came with um, that just because you, you learn more and you've got a highly educated um, uh, set of employees that you can build on, right? So uh, next one, I think it's my last one. Yep, I just, as inspiration, I'll leave you with these two pictures I found um, clearly from the 1950s uh, based on the, the look and feel. But, uh, you know, when Gen General Electric was one of the, the first big design and uh, builders of first generation nuclear, right? So they're selling electricity, right? But General Electric also was smart in that they made and sold appliances that used electricity. Right? So all sorts of ads about how with an electric stove, an electric refrigerator, electric washing machine, an electric cleaner, right? Your, your, life, your life gets better. Right? So think about this synergy between the product that you're making and the use of it and how to get more, more value from it. Um, and you know, if you want an inspiration for a system that uses the energy from nuclear more than just selling electricity, I'll go back to my bio you know, where I started my career on a nuclear submarine. And basically, we use that 
reactor for everything. It, it, drove, it moved the ship through the ocean. It made our electricity. We used it to make water. We heated the sub. We um, um, used it for basically every function uh, we were on board, right? So these systems have been demonstrated in very complex ways. And I think that's the kind of thinking that people should think about um, in this next generation of nuclear energy. So I'll stop there. I'm looking forward to the conversation with, with Glenn and Steve and Josh and, and hopefully answering any questions we can from the audience. Great, thank you, Todd. Uh, if we could just stop sharing you and uh, if panelists sort of um, turn their videos back on, including myself. Um, that was a pretty broad session, right? We talked about technology, we talked about fuel cycles, and we talked about the industry as a whole. I've got a few questions here, but the, I'm going to go straight to the um, participant, the audience questions, because there are a few, and there are some of them quite fresh in our minds already. So the first one is, I think it's for you, Josh, but the it's from Cena, and it regards the the movement towards smaller modular sort of systems and the potential implications of that for treatment of spent fuel. So does that, if you're having a dispersed sort of system, right, where you have multiple small reactors all over the place, um, does that imply uh, on-site storage for the spent fuel or is there, how's that gonna be managed or are the, how would you address the implications of that um, that model? Sure, so I, I mean, I can, I can speak to it, um, you know, from having looked at what we've done in the past in this country with spent fuel management. And, and that is, um, we, and I think it's very important to be upfront about this is we do not have a, you know, a repository solution re ready to go right now. And so I think that any uh, reactor that's being deployed um, needs to be thinking about how it would manage its spent fuel on its site. Um, I think there are several, I guess I brought up, um, consolidated storage facilities that are quote in the works, um, you know, both New Mexico and Texas, as well as the, the Department of Energy is looking at opportunities, but that's a that's a in the future and, and there's no guarantee of success for those facilities. Um, we've historically had trouble siting and, and, and actually getting these things operational. And so I, I think that any, first off, any reactor needs to be able to plan for managing its material probably on site. And, you know, that, that's the first thing. Now, I will say that there are some, some opportunities with that, though, too, um, in that some of the reactors, especially the very small ones, like the micro reactors, those are sort of the, the nuclear battery. You drop, you take them, you drop them in, and you bring them back somewhere. You, you wouldn't theoretically just leave those where, you know, on that site. And so, you know, if you're the first one into an industry, there's the potential that you could think about a, a business model where you take uh, you know, micro reactors back to a centralized location. I mean, that that's definitely in the works, but I think, you know, you know, it, it to, to be transparent and, and truthful, you, any reactor needs to think about managing its spent fuel on site. I mean, to be honest, we, we at INL have spent fuel and have had it here from our, uh, you know, 40 or 52, I can't remember the exact number of reactors. And we've safely managed that material for 50 or 60 years. So it's not really, technically challenging it's not really a uh, you know we've never had safety issues but it is something that you have to think and plan for uh, managing that material uh, on your site be because there is no uh, confirmed pathway going forward thanks josh anybody else have comments to make on that one or we'll move on oh, good okay so the next question is from uh and i apologize if i mispronounce your name uh, Louis Luang, uh, what is the progress in developing commercial thorium reactors in the US? Uh, open to anybody. I'll, I'll give it a try, Glenn. I mean, I think that um, if you look across the country, there is order of magnitude about 50-ish, what I would call private entrepreneurial um, uh, nuclear engineering companies, privately funded. There are a few of them that are targeting thorium reactors um, as their product. That said, um, Right now in the US, we don't really have a thorium fuel cycle, right? We don't have a commercial way to make uh, fuel from thorium reactors. So um, I view these as um, there is some dedicated effort. Um, the, the designers are clearly advocates of that. I just think there's a bigger hurdle, right? Uh, in order to get to commercial because there's just not a history of using those reactors. Um, my personal view is it's not that there is a enough advantage 
to go through all that cost to build up a, a thorium fuel cycle. But you know, it's like all the other companies that are out there, and, and, and they'll they'll prove or disprove you know whether I'm right or not. But I, I'd call it pretty early in the commercial sense. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. And I just uh, amplify a bit of what what Todd said, not just in the in the U.S. but globally, um, the the fuel cycle there there is not a, a thorium based fuel cycle, so that that provides a great hurdle when you begin to think about uh, the le the supply chain leverage uh, that we talked about. So, so an example of that leverage um, is is again I'll. I'll reference uh, the Korean example uh, that Todd gave. Um, they, they sold uh, four large reactors, uh, helped construct the reactors uh, just recently, over the past 10 years or so in the United Arab Emirates. Uh, so the total price on those reactors uh, was about $25 billion. Well, the, the, the fuel supply maintenance and operations contracts uh, that went along with that, in other words, helping manage that whole enterprise going forward, uh, was valued at about that same amount, an additional 25 billion. So that's an example of, uh, you know, it's not just about the fuel cycle in your country, it's about what you can help manage uh, elsewhere, and that sometimes is where where the greater value is. So, so you know, I think I thought I think Todd's exactly right. Um, the hurdle in developing another uh, another type of fuel cycle, the economic hurdle, um, is is certainly significant. So. Thanks, guys. Uh, the next question is from Richard Jones. Um, it's kind of an interesting one because I'm not. Um, educated enough to know what he's referring to here, but the, it seems to me that much of the resistance to nuclear power, besides a misunderstanding of the technology, stems from problems with historic mining processes that provide fuel. Uh, how is this addressed? Now, I, as I said, it's a, I was not aware of that, but perhaps uh, somebody take a swing at ex explaining what, the pro um, what those potential problems were historically and if they've advanced. Any takers? Well, I'll give you a start, and then Josh Josh may have some more details that he wants. I mean, I think historically, uh, the things people point to were um, in the early days of, of nuclear, right? And a lot of these were associated with the weapons programs, um, but it, you know, at some point, um, you know, commercial nuclear diverged from that. And I, but I think for most people, they don't care where it started. Um, we went in, we did a lot of mining, and left a lot of uh, tails, right? Yeah. Um, near water sources and typically uh, on, on or near tribal lands, right? And I think we've never really done a good job of going back and, and remediating those sites. Um, I think historically it, it's very similar to what, what's left up in Hanford, right? They made a lot of decisions in these early weapons programs that the speed of developing weapons was more important than worrying about the long-term solutions. And now we have these very complicated things that need to be cleaned up, right? So. I think some of those decisions to, uh, to rush in the name of national security left environmental impacts and the mine tailings is one of them, right? Um, I think if you look at, uh, and this is where Josh can help me because he may know more. I think if you look at modern mining techniques, um, they've done a lot more to improve how we do that. That said, I do think until we go back and actually finish remediating some of those sites, well, there's always gonna be this, this um, historically accurate um, uh, concern that we haven't cleaned up uh, some of the sites um, and, that, and that they're particularly in un, uh, dis or lower income or disadvantaged communities, right? And, and it makes it appear very, um, very unfair or inequitable. So that's, I think that's some of the politics and history behind it. Um, Josh may know more about the transition between mining technique. Yeah, I can speak to it a little bit, but I think Todd's probably dead on um, based on, on the way I read that question is historically, um, yeah, the weapons program and, and the, the way that, that the US went about the weapons program left 
lots of uh, environmental issues, uh, cleanup concerns that we continue to, the, the federal government uh, continues to struggle with, with cleaning up and it has a, you know, a several billion dollar a year budget to do some of those cleanups. But again, I, I think there's always been concerns on, on how fast and where that goes. As far as the mining itself, I think originally, um, you know, I think a lot of it, uranium was open pit mining, which I think is, um, you know, it, it's maybe not, it's maybe the, the, the least clean sort of mining approach. Um, you know, I'm not a mining expert. Uh, you know, since then, you know, they have shifted more to the sort of in-situ leach mining, um, which does minimize some of that. But I, I think, but I think Todd's dead on as far as, as, the, as the historical issues with mining has dealt with sort of the, the byproducts and the, you know, restoring the, the locations back to, to what they were before. So. Right. Got it. Okay, so the thanks for that. So the the next question, it's I'm going to combine uh, two questions from our audience and one of my own here. Actually, it's it's around the economics of what we're dealing with, the, the advanced nuclear opportunity, the economics thereof. Uh, first question from Tom Seawold: uh, How will the economics of SMRs or micro reactors ever make sense uh, in the absence of a standardization? Uh, good good question. Um, Mike Harmon is asking literally what the cost, the production cost per megawatt hour uh, for micro reactors, that sort of question. And, um, and my question is simply regarding the competitiveness. There is with the thermal base load of generation, um, levelized cost of electricity, it's challenging to in today's market and today's energy markets for that to be competitive. Uh, with renewables and so on and so forth. So, uh, anybody want to have an open discussion around the the general economics of these uh, this opportunity? Steve, you're waving your hand, so you first. Yeah. So those are those are really good questions, and the answers uh, really are varied. So, so I'll look to uh, Todd and and, uh, and Josh as well. So, so with very large uh, commercial nuclear projects, there's been very good experience in terms of, of cost, uh, construction cost, as well as uh, certainly operations cost, um, and really abysmal uh, examples. And that goes for, uh, I think, both the US markets and, and global markets. So one can look to um, um, you know, gross overruns in, in constructability schedule, which takes uh, construction costs from you know three to four thousand dollars kilowatt installed to you know um, the unfortunate examples are you know ten and twelve thousand dollars a kilowatt installed so that's a, the cost of of constructing something um, but uh, recent examples uh, globally you can find bad ones and good ones on the good side uh, the UAE example is is probably one of the more recent uh, and that those those systems come in at four thousand dollars a kilowatt um and and some of the worst ones are examples or the the finland example and of course the uh, uh the reactors uh, the vogel reactors which have gone i think they're ten or eleven thousand dollars uh projected kilowatt installed now i'm not sure where they're at uh small reactors uh, since we're not building uh, any of those yet, I always look at the cost estimates, constructability cost estimates with, you know, uh, appropriate uh, hesitation. But, but I think the, uh, the numbers on those are, you know, $2,500 to $3,500 a, a kilowatt installed. Then you have to look at, at, at the value or the price um, of the electricity or the heat. Uh, that you're getting off those. And so to channel a bit of uh, my inner Todd Allen, then it, it really depends on the application space that you're looking, uh, you're looking at. So um, keeping a current nuclear plant operating um, is uh, what, maybe $35 you're selling, uh, you're producing electricity for uh, $35 megawatt hour, which is a, a really competitive uh, rate. If you look at uh, projections uh, for the, the future, I've seen projections for advanced nuclear on a dollar per megawatt hour, so the price of electricity, uh, not the heat, everywhere from, 
you know, on the low side, maybe the $50. Uh, and then I saw one outline estimate that was like $160 uh, a megawatt hour. But most of the estimates are in the $70 to $90 uh, a megawatt hour range. And in a, in a, uh, in a mission constrained world, uh, that looks pretty good. Now I want to point out, though, that um, nuclear produced heat or on-site electricity uh, in certain markets, uh, some of the better analyses that have been done for use of heat and power in constrained markets like in Alaska actually show nuclear, uh, advanced nuclear coming out far, uh, uh, far in advance, far better than any other available option. Um, and then when you start uh, looking at what kind of products you could make with a, a, a high density zero carbon energy source, the value of the products can go up quite a bit. And in one example, I'll give you just because I was um, reading about it this morning uh, is the analysis that's been done on, on green steel, you know, low, low emission uh, steel products where uh, even absent any sort of emission mandate, um, uh, 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 buyers are willing to pay a 25% premium for a low emission tag that goes on that product. So that's a very long answer to a very simple question, but it, it goes to show it really does depend on what you want to do with the energy, where you're at, and what kind of market we're in uh, in the future. So. Does it look, uh, does it look uh, onerous? No, I think, and I'm a, I'm a skeptic uh, by heart, but, but actually the, the analyses that I see recently um, on, on the potential value or the cost of producing energy, heat or electricity uh, is looking better and better for nuclear. So, I mean, Todd, what, what do you think? It, yeah, I think that's a good answer. The, the other thing that I, I chime in, but the other part of Tom's question was, um, how are you ever going to um, drive down the cost um, through manufacturing efficiencies unless you get to a smaller number of products? I think that's right. I think you do need to get to a smaller number of products, but um, I'm, I'm personally willing to be a little patient, right? I'm, I'm nervous about the nuclear community or the federal system who's providing support rushing to pick the concept they think is the one that's gonna be the best, right? I kind of like this, let them duke it out, right? And set up federal support systems that are milestone based, right? And if, you, if, it's, if a company can't meet the milestones and whether that's technical, regulatory, community support, then, then you drop off, right? And, and let somebody else move up, right? So you, you end up with sort of the best product, right? And then let them drive the costs down. But I just suspect given on past, performance. If we, if we get nervous and we jump and ask the, a bunch of federal technicians, right, to pick the, the one they like, we won't get the best answer, right? So there's sort of some strategic patience um, in, in letting them get, get to the best product. I think it's really important. Yeah, good point. Um, next question, and I, and I apologize if anybody who's submitted a question, we don't get a chance to answer it. I'm trying to pick the ones that cover the most ground. So the next question is about licensing. And Larry Wolf has, has a question here. Do small and micro reactors require NRC licensing? How long does that process take? Has the sodium design been approved by NRC? And uh, I'll add you know, many comments that I've received over the last few months are, are regard to the, um, let's say, challenging timeline associated with TerraPower and Natrium uh, and, and any commentary around the licensing aspects of these, these reactors. Yeah, so maybe one one brief reply. So um, so the challenging nature of of uh, the natrium uh, licensing timeline. You know, I don't pretend to speak for the project. I'm not a, not a part of the the project. I'll just uh, you know I echo the project developer statement that yes, it is it's a it is an aggressive, very aggressive timeline. Um, I think what's important. Yes, the NRC does have to license uh, any of those uh, any of those reactors uh, to uh, one part of your question um, but but the I, I, what I would encourage people to look at is the record um, 
what has been licensed, how long did it take? So, so developers can, you know, take one of one of two different licensing approaches. You know, you'll hear people talk about Part 50 and Part 52 licensing, um, which actually starts with the design certification in Part. 52 if, if you're if you're going down down that route um, the history then is if you look at uh, the new scale the small modular reactors you know they were in development um, and in testing programs for a number of years but when they when they uh, submitted their design certification application to NRC it took it took a little under four years to get that design certification um, NRC, I'll point out, also is considering um, a, a new, I think it's called Part 53 uh, regulatory uh, process that uh, is more amenable, is, is better tuned, I, I guess I should say, to, um, to advance reactors and the safety uh, uh, state uh, of those reactors. How that pans out, uh, I don't know, that'd be a topic of maybe a good seminar if you invited a, an NRC person to talk about what they expect and, and what the history has been. Um, so, yeah. yeah. Steve, just a, a slight bit more on this part 53, right? I mean, the NRC is trying to move expeditiously. Congress gave them seven years to come up with a new process. The, the uh, NRC originally told its staff to move it down to four. I think they backed off a little bit. Um, but uh, to Steve's point, some of the reactor developers want to go faster than that, right? So they're not waiting for this new process. They'll use one of the two original ones, right? So the Part 53 may, may be more influential on deployments that are a little further down the road than, than the, the most immediate ones that people are talking about. Okay, thank you. We got I think we have enough time for one more question here and and it's i'm gonna it's i'm gonna ask it since uh since i'm the moderator i, I can do that i have the power but it's a good one right so you hear this a few times uh is it, it's with respect to the the um the report of 2021 by the union of concerned scientists uh titled advanced isn't always better and that report raised a few in interesting points regarding safety and proliferation and other things um, invite you all to comment uh, on, on the contents of that report and, and what your thoughts are. Yeah, so I'll, maybe I'll, uh, I'll start. So the, um, the analyses that were done in, in the report certainly are, uh, they, didn't, they didn't, I was very, uh, I've been familiar uh, with, with, um, with, with that, that line of analysis and reasoning. And you know, you talk about advanced reactors as a bin, but but maybe just to focus on a couple of things I do know something about. So, for example, um, I gave the uh, the example of the sodium cooled fast reactor. If you have a pool, uh, a pool type reactor, the experience on those uh, have actually been really very good. Um, I gave you the EBR2 example. So the, the, the notion of passive safety um, isn't a theoretical construct. I mean, that, that's something that's been, uh, you know, we've shown and we've validated and demonstrated. Uh, other systems around the world that, that were not pool type uh, sodium cooled fast reactors, for example, I think Manju might've been mentioned in the report. That was a Japanese reactor uh, that shut down early. Um, problems that they had were really operations uh, oriented, uh, very much so. Um, let, me, let me touch on non-proliferation because that's, that's an interesting thing that comes up uh, quite a lot. Uh, when we're even when we're talking about U.S. Uh, reactors to be built in the U.S., so non-proliferation is a is is a serious. It's to be taken seriously, and it's a serious concern when you're thinking about where to deploy nuclear systems around the world. Uh, and and the question is, is somebody going to hijack a fuel cycle and begin the the arduous process of extracting? Um, weapons usable uh, material uh, from a fuel. Uh, that's typically not something we think about here in this country because this country uh, has, uh, you know, we, we, we own and operate, we have 
uh, uh, limits on what people can do within our boundaries. But you know, when you're thinking about export, uh, those are those are consideration. Those are considerations, and there's uh, very effective uh, regimes uh, in place. I would also uh, add, you know, if you're thinking about exporting and growing the market uh, for nuclear technology uh, globally. Uh, the things that we can do today in terms of monitoring and control of a system anywhere in the world from anywhere in the world simply couldn't have been imagined back in the 1960s, 1970s, even the 1980s. So I argue that the landscape is fundamentally different and we need to think about exports uh, differently as well. So that touches on nonproliferation. Uh, cost it also is brought up in the report uh, we've talked about uh, with the other questions that you had, Glenn, uh, talked about cost, uh, talked about what's different going forward, what's been learned uh, over the past 65 years. Um, uh, so it's important to put all of that in, a, in, in perspective and uh, think about what Todd mentioned. Uh, I like this, this way of looking at it. Uh, what's the value of what you're producing versus the uncertainty that you take on or, or the, the, the cost or the risk? And you need to approach that with very open eyes, right? And to do that, uh, you look at data and you look at the best, um, the best uh, data available uh, and the best assessments and the community has to make a decision. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. It's, I mean, we could talk about that. All Great. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, any other commentary on that one? Yeah, I'd say one quick thing, right, which is we have an independent regulator for a reason, right? Um, and I felt that report very much felt like, you know, an opinion that had not changed since the 1970s. And to sort of prejudge the regulator by writing an article seemed kind of off. Gotcha. Okay. Well, that is uh, the end of time. Um, I will open it up. We have, a, you know, literally 30 seconds for any closing comments. Uh, quickly, anybody want to take opportunity there? I'll just, just make one comment. I, you know, I'd applaud what, what the folks, what your colleagues and you, Glenn, are doing in Wyoming. Have a dialogue. Have, a, have, a, have an ongoing dialogue about benefits and, and costs and, and what, what can communities get out of something beyond just shipping electrons off. Josh? Yeah, let me just, just go, you know, Steve, I think I mentioned this a couple of times, there's several sort of more deeper technical comments and discussions that could be had around advanced reactors and advanced, advanced nuclear. And I think uh, at any time, if, if this organization is interested, we are happy to come back and have additional conversations. You know, as a national labs, our goal is to sort of be this like neutral broker and, and try to have these transparent, frank, science-based discussions on these things. So happy to have you know some more of that uh, in the future if those requests come in. Thanks, Josh. Todd? Yeah, I would just, I agree with Josh, right? Uh, please ask, we're always willing to help more. Uh, and I think I would close it with, you know, Steve and Josh left up this question about whether Texas and A&M or Michigan was the better university. It's definitely Michigan. We can close on that. Yeah. Good, good point. Excellent. Excellent closing comment. And top. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, special warm um, thank you to all our panelists, uh, everybody all, uh, who stayed on the call. Um, this has been recorded. I understand that uh, it will be posted through the website, I believe. And um, yeah, thanks once again and have a great afternoon, everyone.